Uh, so glad you guys are here with us today, and I hope you're ready for today, because uh, we've got uh, our next kind of phase, our next kind of step in our series, Built to Last, where we're building on the foundation, building something that won't last for 20 years, 30 years. We want to build something that is eternal. We're building Christ's church. It's what he's called us to do. And so we've laid the foundation. We called those our priorities of transcendence and glory in the church. But then we turned a corner last week on these pillars. And so we're kind of putting walls up on this house. And uh, we're now in our second pillar. So if you have your Bibles, we'll be in John 4 in just a minute. Hopefully you can get there pretty quickly. And I'll set up our time together like this. Um, I love being a dad. Now, there is a caveat to being a dad. There are days. Just because I love it doesn't mean that there aren't days where I want to pull my hair out. Can I get a witness? Man, sometimes, man, it's just kind of hard. You've got, and here's the thing. So like when my kids are at their school doing what they're doing, little ones playing with Play-Doh, Judah's learning to write and do math and all that stuff. And other girls, my girls are learning, you know, Latin. I don't even know who learns Latin anymore, but they do. Uh, And doing math and all that stuff. While they're doing what they're doing, uh, I'm doing what I'm doing at work. And I'm, you know, meeting with people, meeting with you guys and having coffees and lunches. And we're planning ministry and I'm studying. Um, and uh, I'm sitting at my desk working on uh, what God's laid on my heart to do, and sometimes the days are long. Have you ever had those days at work? Uh, Man, where it's just a hard meeting, a hard conversation, or just long days, and so while my kids are doing what they're doing, I'm doing what I'm doing. Sometimes my day's hard, and uh, one thing that kind of lifts my spirits and kind of gets my heart in the right place uh, is when I come home, and I open the door. Now, it doesn't happen every day, uh, but it just seems like God strategically does this when I need it. And when I walk in the door, uh, you know, one of them or many of them, you know, would say, Daddy, Daddy, you're home. And they just run up there and they just wrap their arms around me and they're excited. And especially when the little one does it, he did it this morning when I walked up to the kids' room and he just comes and tackles me. And man, that does something to my heart as a dad, seeing my kids do that. And that right there is actually at the epicenter of what God wants for his children, his church, when they gather in worship. When we gather and we do what we just did right here in this singing, and now we're continuing in worshiping, uh, sitting under the teaching of God's word, but when we're worshiping together, uh, what he longs for his children to do is what my children do, and they say, Dad, God, you're here. God, we love you, man. We've, We've missed you, and we're so excited to be with our other family members, our other brothers and sisters in Christ, and we and when we come together and we sing, we're proclaiming, God, we, we love you. We welcome you in this place. We're so glad to be in this room worshiping you. That's what God wants from us is adoration. He wants our affection. He wants our attention. He wants our, our worship. Now, um, we need to make sure that we're all actually on the same page when we talk about worship because I think some of us have different ideas of what worship might or might not be. And so I, th- I want to help you. Is it okay if I help you today? Okay, good. So I want to help you understand what worship is. So in the Old Testament, when they would talk about worship, um, this would be a good thing to jot down, what is worship. In the Old Testament, what worship was is it was an idea to fall or to prostrate yourself before someone on the ground. So you're uh, literally laying out, your forehead is on the ground, and you're laying in front of what you're worshiping. Now in the New Testament, um, what worship looked like and you have to understand the old testament is influenced by hebrew culture um, and then now the new testament is influenced by the roman greek culture and this is pretty interesting what worship is in the new testament is this idea of is essentially still bowing down getting low uh, but then uh, kissing towards kissing the signet ring of the emperor that kind of idea have you ever seen that on some of those old history channel shows that's what worship was pictured like in um, the New Testament. And I want you to see what this looks like. Danny, can you come here real quick? Now, I love Danny, but I, I, I'm gonna show you uh, what worship looks like. So this is what, I love you, man, by the way. Okay, um, so this is what worship looks like. Now, before you laugh too much, you should ask yourself, are you doing this? Worship is kneeling, and it's subservient. I'm lower and you're higher. Worship is a place of humility, and um, it's magnification. 
It's magnification. And so when you're laying at the feet of anything other than Christ and Christ alone, that's what we're doing. We're magnifying this, demagnifying ourselves. And how many of us are doing this? In the Greek culture, I would grab his hand and kiss his hand, but he's sweaty, so I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Pro- powerful, isn't it? Does that make you feel weird? Uh, that was very weird. It, now, here's the thing. It, it, it should make him feel weird. Was that awkward for you? It should, make, it should be awkward. It should be awkward. Thank you. Practically speaking, what we're going to move forward towards is our definition of worship would be adoration. Adoration, and really what adoration means is it literally means just to worship. It's deep love. Um, If you read through the book of Psalms, it's to ascribe worth. Uh, We don't use that very much, ascribe, but it's to give. And when the English translators translated worship originally into English, they used the word worth-ship, one word, worth-ship. And then as we, uh, you know, modulated as a society, we dropped the TH and just came to worship but it's ascribing worth it's uh, projecting affection and adoration Uh, it's uh, magnification of one thing and demagnification of another thing now if we're all honest today uh, we have to um, um, ask ourselves or not really ask ourselves really actually we actually uh, like we don't even have to ask ourselves we do this all the time right like we we worship we ascribe we get we throw off worth onto things all the time without even thinking about it don't we Think about it. Like, just be, like, here it is. Like, your job. We, we, we prescribe a little bit of worth. We give some worth. We give some attention. We give some affection to that. Uh, maybe it's to your education, and you value the letters before your name or after your name. Uh, maybe we ascribe some worth to relationship, and if you're longing to be married, you're chasing that sucker down, and you're going after that, and that's where you're putting a lot of your attention and your affection and your worth in that. Or maybe your marriage gets, uh, uh, you know, an unhealthy dose of worship to where you're bowing your knee at the altar of your marriage. Or, uh, I mean, this is a hard one, but our kids. How many of us reorient our entire lives and our entire schedules around making sure that our three-year-old is in competitive soccer on the Olympic development team? And you travel the kingdom come to Kalamazoo all the way to Maine. And I'm just telling you, your kid's not making the Olympic, Olympic team but yet we reorient our lives around that. Maybe others of us, it's sports, just we love a sports team, so we paint our bodies and we raise our voices and lose our voices. A really hot one in our culture today, sexuality and sexual identity, and we bow our knee at that. Schedule, kids, image, health, conscious, man, I want to, what am I portraying to people? I'm not saying all of these things are bad, but can we sit in this moment for just one second and let me ask you this question. Could you and me, could, our, could the church of Jesus Christ be throwing off or throwing on worth, attention, adoration, deep love, and affection, and attention onto these things at an inappropriate level. Now, if we're honest today, I bet many of us would say, yeah, pastor, that's me. I I, I probably have given a little bit more attention than is healthy, that's reasonable to the job or to, to to the marriage or to the, I'm not saying that these are wrong. I'm saying, could you and I be giving, throwing off a little bit more worth than is reasonable and that is reserved only for Christ and Christ alone? And here's the cool thing is that if you're sitting in the seat today going and you're honest and you're going, yeah, you know what? I've probably done that. Maybe I'm not doing it right now, but I've done it before in my life. And if you're sitting there today, I've got really good news for you. That's a great place to be. Because that little moment of honesty, that little check in your own heart recognizes that that's a moment for us to change, that we can actually do something about that. See, we know intuitively how to worship. It just gets a little clunky when we get in this room. And there's no reason for that. What God wants for you and for me and for us today is to redirect the worth that we're prescribing and ascribing onto 
objects that cannot hold the worth with which you're giving to it and give it to the only one who can hold the worth that is worthy of the worship that you're prescribing to lesser things. And so what we do is we find ourselves in an awesome passage in John 4. You see, nothing, nothing brings the glory down. That's what we've been talking about is what brings the glory down. And we talked about the unapologetic preaching of God's word. And today we're unpacking this idea of unashamed adoration of God's son. And nothing brings the glory down faster, someone once said, than when God's people with everything that they have worship Jesus unashamedly and give him everything that is due his name. So in John chapter 4, we see this story of a, of a young lady where Jesus is in a forbidden territory talking to the girl from the proverbial other side of the tracks. And she comes to him at this well in the middle of the day, which is not for us, no, that's no big deal, but in that culture, that means she is probably not the classiest, classiest of ladies. And so he meets her at this well, and she thinks she's coming for water, and Jesus exposes her heart and where she's sitting at right now that she's been with five different dudes and the guy she's with now is not even her husband. And Jesus does what he always does and we think he's dealing with that, but there's something under the surface there. He gets to the bottom of whatever her real thing is and when she encounters that, it's a little stingy, it hurts a little bit, but yet she's at the moment where she is met with real hope and real change. And so she tries to change the subject like all of us do. You ever been convicted by God and go do something the opposite of what he's asked you to do? And you try to shake that thing off like you know you should talk to your spouse, but you shake it off. You know you should go talk to your boss, but you shake it off and you don't deal with the conviction that God laid on you. And you, oh, I'm gonna talk about something. You change, quick subject change. It's exactly what she did. What's interesting is that the subject change just deeply exposes even deeper what her real issue is. And right here in these four verses, in chapter 4, verses 20 through 24, we uncover the most concentrated teaching on what biblical worship is. In four verses, the word worship is 10 times, used 10 times. If it's used more than once, you should probably identify. That's pretty cool. If you repeat yourself twice to your kids, th like you mean it, right? So if you said it 10 times, how important is that? Oh, come on, you can do better than that. Very, Very important, right? And, and so uh, if you want to do a sermon on worship, shouldn't you be able to see it in the Bible? You should, right? Oh, this, is, this is confusing me. Maybe Facebook is acting a little better today than what we, you guys are, but I need you to participate with me and engage with me, okay? So if you're gonna preach a sermon on worship, shouldn't you be able to see it right there in the Bible? Yeah, so thank you so much. Thank you so much. Now we can get started. All right, so verse 20, here we go. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where we ought to worship. So right now you see this, that history, if we know, and, and again, John is assuming that, that, that we all know Hebrew history, and many of you probably don't, and I wouldn't know it unless I studied it, and so he's assuming that we know this. So Jews and Samaritans, which is, this is a Samaritan woman, they used to be one people. They were like this, they were tight. And then there's a moment in their history where there was a separation. And 2 Kings chapter 17 tells us how it happened. They went after false gods, forsook all the commandments of Yahweh. So they went the opposite direction, and now they were one people, separate people. And they began worshiping a different God. And so what she's saying is, hey, so I know the Jews have got this place, and, and we got a place too. Here's a picture of the mountain she's talking about. Uh, it's called Mount Gerizim, and this mountain actually is we had him there it is there we go that is a picture from the actual well perceived to be uh, believed to be well that they were standing at and that's the mountain that they were talking about and they were and she was saying hey we built a place too where we go and where we worship just like the jews did the jews have a mountain too and it, it was in jerusalem it's mount zion and here's where the this is modern day mount zion uh this is and so you have a mountain we got a mountain and here right now it's all about where we're worshiping so we worship here you worship there we worship here you worship there it's all about location well that's really not the point, and uh, Jesus is going to kind of help her understand that. In verse 21, he explains, Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain, the one that they're looking at, or in Jerusalem, Mount Zion, will you worship the Father. Every time John uses the phrase, the hour, he's referencing uh, the cross, you remember, if you're new to the Bible, you might not know this, but if you've read the Gospel of John before, at the very beginning, his very first miracle was turning water into wine. And so when he did that, he, he, the first thing he said to his mom is he, he says, paraphrase by the way, hey mom, 
the hour has not yet come. That was, it's, it, it, listen, he's alluding to the cross where that's like his, this is where it's all heading and we're not there yet. I know you're excited because you know I'm the son of God, but you need to take a chill pill for just a second. And so right now in this moment, this is John saying, hey, there's a moment coming. Jesus is saying, hey, the hour has not come, but there is a moment, there is a time there is a specific moment in time. And the cross, it's going to change everything. It's going to change everything for you Samaritans. It's going to change everything for the Jews. As a matter of fact, it's going to change everything for everyone on the planet. The cross is the dividing marker in human history. It changes everything for everyone. He goes on. And he says, you worship what you do not know. You worship what you do not know. Ouch. <laughs> Stings a little bit, doesn't it? It's, it? It feels a little confrontational, but yet it's not totally that way. You worship what you do not know. And this really is the idea of that worship is not about a place. It's not about holding to a religious formula. It's not about a routine. So many of us were like that. We like to get into this, oh man, I'm reading the Bible through in 65, 365 days, and if I miss a day, then God doesn't love me. That's not true. I just gave you guys a little bit of a moment to take a, a breath. That's fine. God wants your love and affection, but if you miss a day, it's not like God's going, shame on you for that. No, it's not like that. Uh, but worship, we do that. We make it a routine. It's a, a routine. It's a formula. It's a, a system that we uh, contribute to and that we're a part of. But I want to give you a little bit today where you can take a little breath it's not about where we're worshiping. It's not about a formula. Worship is about a who. If you get the who right, everything else falls into place. And if you're worshiping the right who, guess what? You can rest in his presence, and you don't have to perform to get him. Worshiping the right who allows your soul to rest and not to run. Which brings us to our first point, that true worship, true worship, it is connected to knowing. True worship is actually connected to knowing. See it in the text right there. I'm not making it up. It's right here in the Bible, verse 22. You worship what you do not know. It was the apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 3 in verse 10 where he said this to the church at Philippi. He said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. It's really, if you want genuine, authentic, you know, earth-shattering, window-rattling worship where you're welling up with great emotion and you sense his presence, you want true, genuine worship, uh, then really, you have to know who you're worshiping personally. We, as a church, have to know who we are worshiping, and that's what we want to do today. It was in 1976, Dr. S.M. Lockridge preached a very famous sermon. He's from California, but he preached it in, De in Detroit. This sermon was, has been translated now into several different languages and heard by over a couple of million people, thanks to YouTube. And in his famous conclusion, he has a refrain that just hits at the heart at just the right time where he constantly asks the question, do you know him? Do you know him? Do you know him? You see, it matters if you, if you know him. And in S.M. Lockridge's message, this is what he says. He says that David said, the heavens declare the glory of God. My king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. And then he starts sermon slamming. His, he is enduringly strong, entirely sincere, eternally steadfast, immortally graceful, imperially powerful. He is, impartially, uh, he is impartially merciful. Do you know him? He is the greatest phenomenon that ever crossed the horizon of the world. He is God's son. He's the sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He stands in solitude of himself. He is awesome, and he is unique, and he is unparalleled, unprecedented. He is the loftiest, eye, uh, loftiest idea in literature, the highest personality in philosophy, the supreme problem in higher criticism, the fundamental doctrine of true theology, the cardinal necessity of spiritual religion, the miracle of the age, he is the superlative of everything good you choose to call him. He is the only one qualified to be the all-sufficient all Savior. I wonder, do you know him? He goes on. He supplies strength for the weak, available for the tempted and tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards the sick, heals. He guards uh, and guides. He heals the sick, cleanses the leper, forgives the sinner. 
He discharges the debtor, delivers the captives, defends the feeble. I wonder, do you know him? Well, my king is the king. He's the key to knowledge. He is the wellspring of wisdom, the doorway of deliverance, the pathway of peace, the roadway to righteousness, and the highway of holiness. He is the gateway of glory. Do you know him? He goes on and says, his promise is sure. His light is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. He says, I wish I could describe him to you, but he's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible and he's irresistible. Well, you can't get him out of your mind. You can't get him off of your hand. You can't outlive him and you can't live without him. The Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out that they couldn't stop him. Herod couldn't kill him, the death couldn't hold him, and the grave could not stop him. Do you know him? Do you know him? Because if you know him, then it elicits a response of allegiance and adoration and reorienting our lives around ascribing to him the worth that is due his name. True worship is connected to knowing, but also it's connected or it's born out of relationship. True worship is born out of relationship. You've got to know him, but you've got to know him in your heart. It's connected to relationship. Look at the very, let's just read verse 22 again. It says, you worship what you do not know, and we worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. Everybody say from the Jews. Now, if we're not careful and we don't do a good job studying, we'll just skip on. But if we take time to sit in the passage for a second, then this lights up our world. When you read from the Jews, it sounds a little egotistical, doesn't it? It really sounds like it's national salvation. And it's for one person. It's just for Jewish people. But if we read it that way, we're reading it incorrectly. From, circle that in your Bible, from, check this, it means out of. From means out of. So Jesus is saying, hey, listen, salvation, freedom uh, and forgiveness of sin and eternal life from God in heaven is not for the Jews, but it's from, it's out of them. This is the message of the gospel. This is the message of the good news of Jesus Christ, that Jesus, from Genesis 3.15, there was a plan in place long before that, that Jesus would be born out of a Hebrew lineage, out of a Jewish lineage, and that he would save people from their sins. All that thing that you do, that you try to cover up and you hope nobody finds out, that's called sin. And the good news is that you let Jesus' light reveal that darkness in you, and you will be forever forgiven and forever free. That's the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's all awesome news that you can be forgiven of every wrong thing that you've ever done who can can get a witness that is good news and salvation is from the jews not for them but it's from christ who was it we follow a jewish rabbi you know we follow a jewish carpenter y'all that's who you follow your god is a jewish god jesus savior jewish savior that's who we follow and the gospel of good news comes from him to you and to me it's what Paul described in Romans 5, 8, that God shows his love for us, that while we were still sinners, doing what we do, Christ died for us. That's good news. Check this, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For our sake, for whose sake? Whose sake? For whose sake? For our sake, he made him, that's Jesus, to be sin who knew sin. Check that so what? I taught you that last week. So that is the hinge. So that what? so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's why he did it. Galatians 3, the key to this right here, to understanding from the Jews, check this. Paul said this, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, so that, so that what? In Christ, the, so that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham, was he a Jew? Hebrew? Yes, he was. It's coming out of that seed, from the seed of Abraham, through that family lineage, so that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to Gentiles. That's us. Uh Uh-oh, there's another word. So that, again, why? So that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. 
That's the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ so that you could receive this message today. You see, when you and I uh, uh, reflect and lean into the relationship that we have with Jesus Christ through the message of the gospel, what it does in your heart and what it does in my heart, at least it ought to, is an explosion of praise for what God has done in our life. See, some of us don't realize that we really were that bad. Just look at your neighbor and say, you bad. Look at your other neighbor and say, you're worse. I'm just playing. I'm just playing. But some of us don't realize just how bad we are. And the reality is, is that even if one white lie is the only thing you ever did in your life, that one sin has separated you from God. And that by the power of the cross and what Christ did, that can bring you to faith in Jesus Christ and your belief in him will now put you in a right relationship with the Holy God. And that causes an overwhelming tidal wave of praise out of our hearts. You see, worship is, it it starts with knowing and then it moves into this continuum of it builds upon, it's born out of a right relationship with God. And then thirdly, God is seeking true worshipers. God is seeking true worshipers. Look at verse 23. But the hour is coming and is now here when, what's that phrase there? What does it say? When the true worshipers, say that again, when the There we go. We'll worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is what? He's he's doing what now? Yeah, like hide and seek. He's seeking. He's seeking such people. What people? True worshipers. God is seeking true worshipers to worship him. Well, we know this story a little bit of this lady. I don't have time to do the whole chapter. If you look at it, you're like, whoa, that's a long chapter. It is. And what's interesting is, is that we know this lady's story, that at this well, uh, she is, uh, Jesus kind of brings up her husband's situation. <laughs> and, uh, and really all it was, was an angle uh, to actually go deeper than that. To which some of us would say, hey, pastor, I can't think of anything deeper than calling a lady's issue out into the light. To which I would agree, like that's pretty, that's pretty deep, that's pretty tough. But what Jesus always does is goes right to the heart of the matter. The reality is, is that this woman, her entire life, has been running to the well of significance, running to the well of relationship, running to the well of expressing her sexuality and giving herself and giving her worth to these men and trying to find significant from those wells. And the reality is, is that every single well that she's been running to her entire life has all, all of those wells, they've run dry. Every single one of them. They overcommit and underdeliver every time. It feels promising up front. The new relationship feels exciting. Uh, the, The physical contact feels amazing. But then three or four weeks later, three or four years later, it wasn't what you thought it would be because the well run dry. You ascribed worth. She gave worth. She gave allegiance to something that can't hold the worship that she was giving. And I think many of us today can probably identify with this woman, not in specificity of the sin, but in the description of what she was doing. What are you running to today? That you've been running to your whole life. That you know beyond a shadow of a doubt, is an empty well. Maybe you feel like her and you've spent yourself over here and spent yourself over there and you just don't have enough energy left to return to God what is rightfully his. You're exhausted. And what Christ is saying to this this lady is, no, sister, you don't have to run anymore. You don't have to chase after that anymore. All of those are dry wells and I am now, you're standing before the only one, the the living water. And if you drink from this, then you'll never be thirsty ever again. This water in this well never satisfies and you'll never find the bottom of this well. And so many of us, I think we've just ran over here and over there, given worth here. We've laid prostrate on the floor and given allegiance and reoriented our lives around finding hope in wells that all run dry. And I'm not saying it's wrong to get excited about this new renovation project in your house. 
I'm not saying that it's wrong to uh, get fired up about the new promotion. I'm not saying it's wrong to get fired up about graduation in May. I'm not saying it's wrong that uh, you're getting, I mean, you're totally jumping up and down that all your kids are out of diapers now. I'm not saying that it's wrong to celebrate Valentine's Day and get excited about your marriage and plan weekend trips. I'm not saying that it's wrong. I'm just saying that the worth and the value and the reorienting of our lives and attention and affection given to those things is at a paramount difference than what we ascribe and the worth and the supreme value that we give to the God who lets you and me live today. And we already know how to do it. And so it's like this woman, don't, don't come before the fountain and ask God for a Dixie cup when he wants to break the dam open and flood your soul with his presence. Why would you want a thimbleful when you can have oceans? Redirect the worth. Redirect the adoration. Redirect the affection into the space that is only worthy of the body paint, losing voice, screaming at the top of our lungs. That's what church should be. We should have every Sunday signs like you have at sports games. Not John 3.16 because I know it. So if you're showing it to me, I already know it. But we should, I'm not asking for body paint either. If you show up next week with body paint, I'm going to ask you to put a shirt on. But what I'm saying is, is that that kind of allegiance, that kind of feeling there, that's for God and no one else. True worship, lastly, involves head and heart. It involves head and heart. He goes on to say in verse 24, God is spirit. I wish I had time to just unpack those three words. I don't. But it's a powerful phrase. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. True worship has, it's involved with head and heart. It's got head and heart. It's got to be right. It's got to be true. It's got to be accurate. But it can't just be neck up. You ever been in that church? You just saying it was true. No emotion, but it was true. I grew up in churches like that. That's not what we want. We don't want that. We want head and heart. We ought to feel something. At a visceral level, it should stir something up within us. Spirit and in truth. It's got to be true, but it's also got to have the spirit. And God wants his church to worship in spirit and in truth. It's not either or. It's not hyper-emotionalism. And it's not doctrinally hardcore true where I stand up here and you have no idea what I'm talking about. It's spirit and it's truth. It's, it's both together. It's head and heart. Which then you should be asking yourself, hey, pastor, what, is that so, what does that look like? What does spirit and truth, what does head and heart church look like? Somebody asked me that. Thank you. I appreciate that. What does that look like? I'm so glad you asked. This is what it looks like. This is not original to me, but it's helpful, okay? The first thing that worship like head and heart worship should look like that we want to rally our hearts around is number one, it's got to be vertical. The worship has to be vertical. Psalm 96 tells us in verse one, oh, sing to the Lord, a new song, sing to the Lord, all the earth. So we don't just sing about God. That's true worship. And we don't just sing about him. We sing to him like he's in the room. You ever had that conversation where some, like I'm right here, you're talking about me and I'm right here, just talk to me. That's what God's like in church. I'm right here, just talk to me. I'm right, I'm like right next to you. I'm right next to you. He's in all these empty seats. He's all around this place. So we sing to him, not just about him. It's gotta be vertical. Number two, simple. Do you know everybody's got a playlist these days? Everybody's got a playlist. I got a study playlist. Joy introduced me to this one on YouTube. It's bomb for studying, so good. Did you know that even Fiona at the zoo has got a playlist? Everybody's got a playlist these days. And God's got a playlist too. God's got a playlist, and it's, part of it's found in Isaiah 6. He says, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. The whole earth is full of his glory. Ro- uh, Revelation 4 tells us, worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. Revelation 5 tells us, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever. There is power in simplicity. If you have to have a dictionary to understand what we're talking about right now, when we sing and we gather in worship, then that's neck up worship. We got a course correct. Simplicity paves the way to intimacy. 
Simplicity paves the way to intimacy. Let me, let me help you out with this. When I was ordained several years ago in the ministry, um, I, got, I had this huge service. It wasn't huge, but it was a service. And uh, I had these men. We had like some 60 men there uh, that are ordained as well. And, um, and if you don't know this, I'm going to let you in on this. Uh, and they put me, I mean, it was a grilling session. Talk to me about the trichotomy. You're like, what's, okay, we're done. Okay, all those kinds of stuff. You know, give me all the omni qualities of God. Uh, what is dispensationalism? All the isms and words and ologies. Like it was all that. I, they grilled me for over an hour. And then they affirmed me. And they anointed me. And they laid their hands on me one by one. Starting with my own dad. And then my father-in-law. And then my pastor. And then my other pastor my youth minister who was there when I surrendered to ministry, all these men come around and whisper prayers in my ear. I w- there was a puddle of tears at the bottom of my, where I was sitting. It was powerful. And after all of that, after they prayed, they signed this document, a certificate of ordination. And on this, there's only a few names, of seven or eight names, but on the back of this, there are 50 other names are written on the back of this. Now, this is super special to me. After that uh, moment, and I was exhausted, after that moment, um, they, uh, we have a service. And I invited my father-in-law, who uh, some of you have met before. You'll meet him again. He'll be here uh, in the spring. And he stood up in front of our church doing what, we're, what I'm doing right now. And like where Aaron Zabo is sitting here, I was sitting right there, right next to my wife. And he preached his socks off a sermon for me. And it was very personal. From his heart to mine. And afterwards, they gave me a Bible at the ordination, after that service. And what I didn't know is my father-in-law printed the sermon on this. And there's not a day that's gone by in the last however many years it's been that I haven't looked at this and remembered the tears that I saw flowing down his cheeks as he commended and commissioned me into service. Both are right. Both are true. This is personal, from his heart to mine, and compels me to love him even more. That's worship. That's the spirit of worship. Simple, personal, articulatable, connects my heart. You with me? Simple. Number three, it's emotive. Now, we've already talked, we're talk, unpacking the idea of head and heart worship, but uh, I read this this week. I'm just going to add to this, and then we'll move on, uh, that emotionless singing is an oxymoron. I thought that was great. Emotionless singing is an oxymoron. You even know this to be true. If you've ever been to a Garth Brooks concert, pick your artist of choice. Is, is he lack of emotion? Absolutely not. I don't care who you, whatever, you've, if you've ever seen him on YouTube, Google him. Oh, my word. Any music has emotion, but the music that should have the most emotion and elicit the most response is the worship and the music that we give back to God. God gave you those emotions. I used to have a boss that said, I don't even know why we have those. And I'd correct him and say, God gave them to you. You should use them every once in a while. God gave you those emotions. God wants us to emote our deepest feelings and thoughts about him and give them to him in our worship. Not emotionalism, y'all. Not emotionalism. But yes, giving there, you should feel something in this. It's not emotionalism, but it's not stale. What do you do with stale bread? That'll that'll preach, make croutons. (laughs) You can be a crouton all you want. I'm throwing it away. Don't be stale. God doesn't want that. Number four, here's the last one, physical. Mark chapter 12, verse 30, tells us to love the Lord with all our strength. All of our strength. This means strength of passion, Strength of intellect, but check this. It means strength in our physical bodies. So the, 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 what, what connects head and heart is getting your body involved. What connects head and heart is getting your body involved. And David understood this very, very well. And, uh, and he, he wrote about this all throughout the Psalms. When we say, when, now moving forward, when we say physically getting involved in worship, here's what I mean. Number one, your voice. Number one, your voice. David said in Psalm 116, I love the Lord because he has heard my cry. He's heard my cry. David was a fired up guy. 
fired up guy. Uses the word loud a lot, cry a lot, sing aloud. David is not a mamby-pamby, like I know you think he is because he's a worshiper, like he's the tight jeans and scarves and gaping v-necks. That's not necessarily David. He killed a bear with his bare hands. He ruled and reigned. He was the greatest king in the history of Israel. And he said, lift up your voice. So those of you that are men and you're really masculine, knock it off. Lift up your voice. The greatest man, one of the greatest men in all of the Bible said, let cry out to the Lord. Worship should involve our voice. Now, there are times of intimate reflection and it would be inappropriate to respond. But when it is the appropriate time, lift up your voice. Lift up your voice. Number two, what you got to get involved is your eyes. Really? Totally. Check out Psalm 123, verse 1. I lift up my, to you, I lift up my eyes. How many of you are guilty in worship of closing your eyes? Raise your hand. Come on, raise them up. Raise them up. Yeah, all of us. A lot of us in the room, right? So when we do that, I know what we're doing. You're doing the same thing I'm doing. I just want to focus. I want to zone in. I know the song, so I can close my eyes, and I'm, I'm good. Um, we should stop doing that because we're taking vision out of the experience. When I was in Arizona, there was a particular song that I just, I didn't like, just being real. I did not like it. I was very vocal about it. I, said, I, felt, like a, I felt like a wuss singing that song. Like a guy doesn't say things like that. Like a man just wouldn't say that. However, knowing what I have studied about worship, I didn't take my, maybe I, I, I didn't, I took my voice out of it, but I didn't take my eyes out of it. And one of the worship leaders that was a girl that was singing, I could worship by watching her go after it with everything she had. And God deepened my heart and appreciation for the song and it ministered to me because I watched her worship and my, she's getting after it, something must be wrong with me. So I'm just gonna lean into this and I'm gonna worship God through this. Some of us, as I was in here, I was turning around. I was trying to get after it, let God speak to me, but I turned around and saw a few of you with your hands raised and that ministers to my heart. That deepens my worship when I open my eyes and see. And really, if you don't feel comfortable doing that, just look up to the sky. I know we're in a room, but look up to the sky because Jesus is standing at the edge of heaven listening to what we're saying. And I want you to picture him peeking over the streets of gold through the gates, looking at us and saying, that's my bride, that's sunrise. And see his eyes, see his face. And he longs to move in this place and look at him and beg him to do it through what we're singing. Let it fall on his ears and let his presence fall on us. See it with your eyes. It's gotta be with your eyes. Now, it's got to be with your eyes, but more than that, it's got to be with our head. Our head. Got to involve your head. Now, I'm not talking about thinking. Psalm 3, 3 says, Oh, you, O oh Lord, are a shield about mine, my glory, and the lifter of my head. Sometimes, life is hard. Amen? And the universal sign for discouragement, oftentimes, is navel-gazing. You're just down. And I get it, because sometimes life is hard, Right? Life is hard, but can I encourage you? You trying to lift your head isn't going to do it, but by the power of the Spirit of God in you, lift your eyes into the hills to the one who has made you and who has sustained you and is the only one who can fix the season that you're in today. Lift your head, get your perspective fixed on Christ. He also asks us to get our hands involved. You know what the top three things are to do with your hands in worship? Number one is your pockets. Number two is the chair in front of you. And number three is across your chest. I searched the Bible this week and couldn't find that anywhere in the Bible, that that's what we should do with our hands. Did you know that? You can check me on it, but I, I, I can't, I, it's not there. I can't find it. So what, what, is, what, what are we supposed to do? Well, I like what Psalm 134 tells us. Lift up your hands to holy places. That's what we're supposed to do. Now, because I love you and I want to help you take your next step, can I help you do that right now on a real practical level? Real pra I mean, come on, this is going to get real practical and you better have a sense of humor. I saw this several years ago and there are th uh, four different stages of worship. Rookie, intermediate, pro, and expert. Now, for those of you that are pocket people, chair holders, or arms crossed, if you're a pocket person, your next step is very simple in rookie worship. Just wag your elbows to the beat. <laughs> Come on, man. That's all you got to do. If you're bold and you want to help, you want to move on to the next level, just, just 
just put your hands out like this and carry the TV. <laughs> or maybe a big screen if you're really big, going big. So that's rookie move. Some of you need to get your hands out of your pockets and carry the TV. It's fine. Just go for it. But if you're here, you might as well go to the next level of intermediate worship and just tell us how big your fish was. And you're just contemplating. You're just big. It's easy. It's very, very easy. And then there, if your next step, it's hold the baby. Just hold the baby. And then your next step is the Mufasa. Ah, so then we are. Now, if you're here and you really want to worship, this is spirit-filled worship. Just screw those light bulbs in while you're up there. Just welcome his presence. Next, the goalpost. This is my favorite move, Joy and I's favorite move. It's the goalpost, heartburn. Mm. That was good. That was good. That was great. Thank you, Lord. And then if you're here, the next step is the pointer worship. Man, he's good. I like to do that one. Or the hatchet. That's a wrong one. Don't ever do that. And then the schoolroom worship. I have a question. I have a question. Now, this next phase is for if you're Methodist, Baptist, or Presbyterian, you just need to check yourself at the door. Because right here, this is hard for you. And this is like warning label YMCA both hands. Village people worship. <laughs> Reckless abandon work worship. And then it, the next phase is Yo Adrian. It's Rocky, Rocky worship, or it's all good. Field goal or touchdown. Now, I say all of that to say that we ought to be a people that get our hands out of our pocket, off the chairs, and off of our chests. And we should be involved in worship. And you've got four phases you can go after now. And if I see you mufasa for four weeks, I'm going to challenge you to go to the next level. Because you better do it. Because God's worthy of it. That's a joke, but not. Psalm 47.1 tells us to clap our hands, all of the people, and shout to the Lord. Shout to him. Can I just get everybody to start clapping? Just clap. Hey, you know what clapping does? Keep going. It brings energy. It brings excitement. And it brings volume. Our worship should be loud. Our worship should be expressive. And I know some of you are from that old school background. I just stretched you like a rubber band that broke. But you need to understand that, that God is worthy of that. God is worthy of that. Lift up your voice. Lift up your hands. And then lastly, I'm stretching everybody. You got to get your legs involved. I know, somebody's heart, I heard your palpitation. I'm not asking you to frolic in the aisles. You can leave that color guard flag at home that you had in high school. I don't want that either. Like, but at the level of appropriateness, it is appropriate to kneel when kneel. If you are a jumper, you should jump at the appropriate time. You should kneel at the appropriate time. I'm a swayer, man. I love to sway because I don't have a ton of rhythm, but I got enough to sway on beat. And so listen, you get involved with your legs at the appropriate level. Now, we're not apostolic and we're not, what's that glory shuffle? We're not glory shuffling. We're not, listen, our uh, guy who does our facilities, he wears a suit and tennis shoes on Sunday so he can run around that auditorium. And I'm not saying we got to do that, but listen, I, I would rather us not be so tucked in, okay? You should be able to break a sweat and worship and not just be Danny. It's okay. And I know you're like, what's going on? Like it's, man, our services are a little longer. Our ser listen, stop being so tucked in. Because the most important thing on planet earth is worshiping the sun, sinless son of God. There is nothing more worthy than orienting your one day. You have six other days in a week to do whatever you want to do. Whatever you want to do. But an hour and a half for us, one time a week, we don't really ask for very much else for our people that go to our church. And so we start flirting with that time and you're like, well, yeah, but you'll drive four hours to the next tournament. And you'll buy season tickets to the Reds, and it's 86 home games. Y'all, that's ridiculous. So when we push into this, God's worthy of this. So, well, you can't do that when you have two services. Yes, you can. You better watch, because we're going to do it. Because God's worthy of our very best, and it's only a little bit of time in the scheme of what we're doing all week long. Can I get an amen on that? Don't leave me up here by myself. Some people are like, well, how's it going? Well, I feel like it's going pretty well. Like sunrise feels like it's going pretty well, but if you don't amen and you don't agree, then I don't know, but it seems to me that we agree on this point. Do we agree? This is the kind of worship that God's seeking and that he wants. And I think the most appropriate thing for us to do in this moment is immediate application. Immediate application immediate application 
physical worship. Head, eyes, hands, legs, involved. I'm not saying manufacture it, but when God is welling it up within you, how do you know when to do those things? People ask all the time, like, I'm Baptist, so I don't know when to raise my hands, okay? If you're raised charismatic, then you already know. You're like, can you start the song right now? I'm ready. You're already, you're ready to roll. You're ready on the first note. But if you were raised in a little bit more conservative setting, you're thinking, I don't know what to do. I'm, I'm starting to freak out now. I just told you what to do. So take a breath. Stand to your feet. Like now. And we're going to put this into practice. I don't want to manufacture it. But, but don't feel like you need to be buttered up. You've had 45 minutes of being buttered up. Don't wait for the emotional rise of the song. It's, worship is emotive. We lift our hands. We clap our hands. We engage. We engage. Say it. We engage. Check this. Let's speak this over our lives. We are worshipers. Say it. Say it again. Say, I'm going to magnify Jesus. Now, You need to get that in your thinking right now that we at Sunrise Church, we unapologetically preach God's word with grace and truth, but we also are unashamed in our adoration of God's son, head and heart, everything we've got, amen? God, we worship you today. We practically apply that which we have learned today and we give you everything in this moment. In Christ's name, and everybody said, amen.